Right, good morning everyone. Super excited to be here in Auckland. Uh, I love this country very much, so it's really nice getting off the plane and seeing New Zealand again. As Danielle mentioned, I'm talking about the role of open map data on the next computing platform. So if you take nothing away from today um, at all, except for one thing, I want it to be that AR has the potential to be the next big computing platform, and I'm gonna explain why that is. But again, if you take nothing else away, this is gonna impact maps in a big way. We all have the ability to, to um, influence that trajectory, and I hope you find this interesting. So AR is coming. I, I think it's very analogous in some ways to self-driving cars, which is a technology that we've heard about. It's been hyped up. Um, we've heard it as something that was technologically possible, but it's been a long way off um, for many years. I think AR is, is the same. We've seen AR for a long time uh, in various forms, and we're gonna explore some of those. But the potential we know is there to have the ability to augment reality over the real world. And that's, that's what it means. If you look at the, the definition that I think most people would, would agree upon, it's that AR is a technology that augments our view of the physical world with digital information. It exists as a layer on top of the physical world. And so we talk a lot about open data and various databases, but if we can start to overlay all that da uh, digital data that we have in various places and put that on the physical world, it's pretty exciting what we can start to do. And I think it's very hard actually to imagine all the possible use cases. I think some people might say though, is, is AR overhyped? VR is a big term as well that's been buzzed around a lot recently, the metaverse. Um, which has been hyped up a lot, obviously, uh, particularly around Meta, the company that I'm here representing. There's crypto, which was another buzzword that we've heard a lot about. I would argue AR is not overhyped. Um, you know, the, these things go through cycles, but at the core, there's underlying technology here that is really exciting, particularly as we figure out form factors beyond smartphones to make it something that everyone can consume and see as they walk around the world around them. So I'm gonna take a trip down to memory lane. Um, I admittedly presented uh, similar slides at State of the Map in the US uh, earlier this year. Not many people uh, raised their hand and said they'd used Urban Spoon, but hands up here who has used Urban Spoon a lot back in the day. Yeah, a few shy hands going up. <laughs> Come on, get them high, who used Urban Spoon? Okay, there's maybe like 5% of the audience. <laughs> So not much better than the US. Um, this was an amazing app. This is like one of the first apps I had on my first smartphone. I just moved to Melbourne and I wanted to explore restaurants around me. And you could just um, have this cool like slider thing, almost like a um, slot machine where you choose the cuisine and the location and the dollar signs and it would, um, you could lock it or just kind of explore random things around you. And then it had a very simple AR, which I think was just using lat long and your phone's compass. Obviously the iPhone was one of the first phones to have a compass like that. You could use AR to see what was around you. Um, so I, I found it incredibly useful as like one of my first practical applications of AR. But fast forward to today, it's, it's starting to make its way into our lives. Um, hands up who's tried AR for shopping. Okay, maybe another 5%, a different 5% for the first 5%. <laughs> this is really cool though, like particularly like I, I live in the United States, Amazon of course is, is very dominant there. I purchased a desk um, a year or two ago during COVID and being able to just scan the room with your phone and augment um, that desk into my empty room and see how it fits in was incredibly practical, incredibly useful. So that's another example of how it's coming in today in the modern world. Face filters, this is less, um, less exciting, I think for me personally, and probably less exciting for these maps people, but it is probably the most prominent use of AR today. Um, obviously the camera is looking at the user in this case, we're interested in projecting it out, but uh, pretty amazing, you know, what the world's computer vision experts are working on right now in terms of Disney filters and everything you see here. Gaming is another one. So this is uh, Pokemon Go on the left-hand side and Peridot on the right-hand side. And Niantic, the company that makes this, is actually an incredible mapping company. Maybe not well-known in our industry, but as people go around and collect Pokemon, 
Um, they're actually helping Niantic build uh, a, a digital twin of the world in many ways um, and create visual positioning technology, which we're going to talk about. But this is, a, again, one of the most widely consumed examples of AR. And then we're getting closer to the stuff that hopefully this audience is excited about, and that's examples like navigation, how to get from A to B without uh, having to get out your phone. Right now, Google's experimenting with Live View, which is using uh, a combination of satellite imagery and Street View imagery and the 3D point clouds that they've created from merging those two sources to be able to show you how to get from A to B in a, in a new city without, um, without needing to like orientate yourself with a map. You just hold up the phone and it can tell you where you are. But we can do better. What about you know, waiting for a ride at Auckland International Airport, wanting to know where your Uber driver is or the bus is, they want to know where you are. Um, just being able to look up and see exactly how far away the bus is or which bus is yours based on all the digital information that we have available today. Navigating by bicycle without having to look down at your phone and potentially get hit by a car. Or another example I think which is really cool is you're walking around a place like the Roman Forum which is, is really incredible historically but so much of it has obviously fallen, um, fallen victim to earthquakes and and pillaging and all the things that happened over 2,000 years. What about being able to see the history that was there in the Roman Forum by just looking through your glasses and, and knowing exactly what that building was, what it looked like at different time periods using the information that archeologists can provide. So the potential is massive and I wanna talk a bit about you know, how this relates to the mapping industry, particularly the open source geospatial industry and why you know, I'm here talking about it as part of Meta. But looking forward just a little bit further ahead, we're going to see some pretty cool things in the, in the shorter term. There's things like BMW's panoramic vision, which is starting to augment some information in the car's vehicle onto the display. They're also looking at um, kind of making the entire windshield a display, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. This could be on a bus, it could be on a car, it could be on your train by giving you information about the world around you. Um, and, and I guess eventually we'll be getting to that self-driving car future where you don't even need to drive. So the potential to use the windshield for, for more things is, is more apparent. But why am I here? Like, why did I fly all this way to talk about AR with you? Meta uses open data. Um, we use open data extensively to build our maps and we're like really committed to open data being an integral part of our map building process. We need maps for um, a variety of, uh, of different applications. So Facebook pages is one where we wanna know the location of businesses. Instagram discovery, which is something we're really excited about and rolling out more now, which is, um, I don't know, actually hands up again if you've used map, if you've seen a map in Instagram lately. Only a few, again, <laughs> it's always 5%. Um, <laughs> so this is something that is not super prominent now. We've experimented in, in, with different, um, different uh, ways of how to show maps in Instagram and still figuring out how to do it properly. But uh, often now when you search for a place, if that place has a, a, a physical location, we can show a map in that situation. But I've heard from a lot of friends anecdotally that this is really great for discovering what's going on, particularly with Instagram stories and, and seeing like what is happening at a given time. All of this relies on, on open map data. WhatsApp business discovery, which is in Brazil and a few other locations, which allows you to quickly like see businesses around and message them. And then we're working on AR and VR products that use open map data um, in a big way. So that's kind of the focus for today, but that's setting the scene. We think that to build maps of the world, it's, it's really not sustainable for companies to lock down and rely on proprietary data. It's a lot more efficient to work together and for map data to no longer be you know, this um, private commodity, but to be a commodity that everyone can build off of. And companies can still uh, be very successful and, and use open map data, but they can build services and analytics and understanding on top of it that's commercially viable with the underlying map data and the tools being open. So some of the open tools that we have, you've probably heard of Maplery, which is a street level imagery platform that hosts um, photos contributed from smartphones or, or 360 cameras or from um, very expensive government rigs that are going around auditing roads. It takes it all and then processes it to, um, 
to understand like what's going on in that world and, and get as much map data as we can. Rapid Editor, which is, this is a tool that we built for OpenStreetMap, and the whole idea here is that we had these machine learning capabilities around 2017 where we could identify buildings and roads from satellite imagery and get them into OpenStreetMap. And so we built a tool to help make sure that the stuff that ML was producing was accurate. And, um, you know, after, after a, a few years of trial and error, um, we got it to a stage that we're very proud of, and we have you know, hundreds of millions of buildings that have been completed. Humanitarian OpenStreetMap has been a big user of that when they very quickly need to understand where population centers are located after or even before a disaster. But then the other cool thing here is that um, we're now starting to host all these different open data sets and the list is growing. Things like addresses, trees, uh, uh, footways, all sorts of things that governments have that you know, maybe they're sitting on a portal somewhere, but they're not in OpenStreetMap. And OpenStreetMap is used by you know, many in this room, it's used by universities, it's used by companies, um, not-for-profits. So if it's sitting in a government portal, um, it's not necessarily usable and consumable. Uh, and that's what we're trying to solve here, giving people easy access to the data so they can conflate it with OpenStreetMap and use it for something meaningful. Um, this is actually done through uh, one of the favorite companies of this audience, um, Esri. They help, to, uh, they help to get the data in there, but hey, it works. It gets to OpenStreetMap in the end, and I think that's pretty cool. And the other thing that we're working on as a team, um, we uh, started a foundation called Overture with Amazon, Microsoft, and TomTom. And this is pretty remarkable, actually. These companies coming together, they've been adversarial for obviously um, many years in, in different domains. But again, realize that map data is something that we should all collaborate on um, rather than competing on it. So Amazon does things like work out where to deliver packages, but also provide geospatial services by AWS. Microsoft does similar through Azure. TomTom Tom is obviously a world leader in navigation. Um, and they're building services on top of this open map data. And there's a bunch of other organizations getting involved as well. But this is open data that people can consume um, and we're yeah, I can talk more about it offline, but th this is something that we're really proud of as well. So why does any of this matter for this community, the open source geospatial community? So as they say, if a map falls in the forest, is it still a map? <laughs> does anyone know who said this? Which famous president said this? No. None of them, yeah. <laughs> no one said it. But I think it's... <laughs> I think it's true, like, like we, we wanna be building maps that are useful. We can have the best map data, but if it's not consumable, then what's the point? And you know, if you, if you kind of come on board with the idea that AR could be the next computing platform alongside, obviously, we've seen the way that smartphones have changed the mapping landscape or digital maps have changed the mapping landscape. AR has the potential to do that as well. And so we wanna make sure as an open data community that we're considering how our data is consumed by these various, um, hardware devices that might be coming out. So on our side, like as a company, we're interested in pedestrian navigation. How can we build routing engines on top of open data? And what are the building blocks to do that? So you know, some of the puzzle pieces that come in, we've got things like addresses, sidewalks, um, VPS, which we'll speak to, tactile paving. There's a whole list of data. A lot of this is in OpenStreetMap, but there's many that isn't. And so we're trying to work out how to combine the data that's in OpenStreetMap with a variety of different sources. And so our approach to build pedestrian navigation, um, you can imagine this is to power something like uh, wearing glasses, going from A to B, wanting to know how to get from A to B. Our approach is to do things like combine open data sets from city governments, um, examples like Boston come to mind, ML on street level imagery, so we're doing machine learning on top of street level in imagery, we know where the sidewalk is in that image and we do our best to create a line string from that. Um, combining that with aerial imagery from fixed wing aircraft and, and drones. And then community collaboration. So on the right hand side here you see Washington DC where we've been working with um, various groups there to, to fill in the map um, and map all the sidewalks that weren't, they weren't in OpenStreetMap. They're in government databases but they're just not in OpenStreetMap. So any routing application that wants to route on top of that data um, finds it very difficult until it's there. So, like practically speaking, we're working, doing things like rapid, 
um, which I mentioned before. So you can just take Austin's footway data, load that in, and if it's correct, it's not always correct, but if it's correct, you can add it in. Um, and that's a, another great example of like, government data is not always authoritative. Um, you know, it has that label, but it's not always the best. And looking at Boston Footways data, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. And that's where human review is super important. And like communities that often have a much better understanding or much more vested interest in a location can help to ensure only the good data gets to OpenStreetMap. So looking at Auckland, like Auckland's pretty good. Um, this is a pretty wide search, so it's looking at um, just like, so one thing with OpenStreetMap, like you can just mark on the road itself that, hey, there's a sidewalk to the left or there's a sidewalk to the right or sidewalk on both sides. That's pretty well mapped in Auckland, um, but not always the independent geometry of the sidewalk. So often we know with a, that the road has sidewalk, but not necessarily exactly where that sidewalk is. Um, crossings fairly well mapped, but as soon as you get outside of these areas, it starts to fall off pretty quickly. So as a community, we can do a lot to improve sidewalks, and there's a bunch of groups around the world that really care about this. Um, cycling communities, obviously wheelchair accessibility communities, pedestrian um, uh, advocacy groups that are doing a lot to improve the state of pedestrian data in OpenStreetMap. We've used a lot of street level imagery in these campaigns. Um, you can derive things like highway equals crossing, surfway surface equals asphalt. This is kind of an example of how you would tag this particular crossing in, um, in Auckland uh, in OpenStreetMap. So it can get pretty complicated like if you start to go to a high level of detail, but really the routing engines as, at, a, at, a, at a core just need to know is there a sidewalk there and where, where am I starting from, where am I finishing. Here's an example of uh, street level imagery in um, derived uh, footways. So we've taken Mapler imagery, we've run machine learning on it to identify sidewalks and we're creating line strings in Katoomba. Um, so if anyone's from Katoomba, I guess this is less than 5%, but um, uh, you can help to review this and see whether it's correct. And then there's the nice to have, things like 3D buildings, which we've helped to create, um, at least in the US, from LiDAR data. But this is something we could do in Oceania, take LiDAR data that's open, work out, um, combine that with OpenStreetMap data about where the buildings are and take the, the average of the highest LiDAR points in each of those locations and start to create like a 3D building data set for Australia. Um, but this is also important for things like AR where you wanna be able to um, place objects. So imagine being able to place a marker, digital marker for this conference venue to show people that are arriving, they're wearing their AR glasses, this is the first time to AUT, um, to show them exactly where the entrance is, where each session is, maybe they can even see the session information digitally overlaid on the, on the windows there, um, but not physically on the windows. So th this is the kind of stuff that I'm really excited about. But another key aspect to kind of make this AR future possible is VPS. Who's heard of VPS before? Um, yeah, this is good, this is good. We're here to learn. Um, <laughs> VPS is, is a really interesting technology. We've all heard of GPS, but it's quite hard in a place like downtown Auckland where tall buildings obstruct the satellite coverage. So VPS is a technology that takes our, the, the, the physical world that you can see um, and that we can uh, to visualize with a camera and uh, combines that with a known representation of that you know, that we might have on a server somewhere to help you localize. So that Google example I showed before was using VPS, where they have street view, they know that they can match up that scene, maybe it's the, um, the Starbucks on the corner with the Starbucks they have on their server, and they can say, hey, we think you're exactly here, and it can be a lot more precise than GPS, or they can combine it with GPS and, and Wi-Fi positioning technology to be able to give you a very um, precise estimate, which is important if you're trying to give people the correct building address uh, entrance for a place like AUT. So yeah, we're working on this. Um, we're combining street level imagery. I mentioned that um, creating these 3D point clouds, mostly of outdoor environments, but also indoor environments. These are the kind of things that, um, this is what kind of what it looks like behind the scenes. This is, I think, Pennsylvania, this uh, Philadelphia airport. And that was created um, just from street level imagery that was captured internally. And as I get to the end, um, yeah, point clouds from Mapley also are used to generate VPS. Uh, this is why we 
we try to encourage as much 360 imagery collection as you can. This is open data that you can go and use. And finishing off, this is the experience that we're talking about, to be able to see restaurants nearby, um, whether your friends have gone there, whether they liked them, how far it is, what the wait time is. It's kind of an infinite range of possibilities. And I think this kind of community is the community that can envisage new possibilities, new ideas for AR. And I'd love to hear if you have ideas uh, what we could build with this technology. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. So we've got five minutes for questions. Has anyone got a question for Ed? Just raise your hand. Cool, we've got a few over here. I'll let the volunteers pick whoever they want to go to. <laughs> Just keep your hands up. Okay, we've got one in the corner. Yep, Ellie, on you. Hopefully I'm audible. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's try this. Is that working? Okay. Um, so I listened to your talk, which was great, by the way. Thanks. Um, I was just thinking about the problem of accuracy with this stuff. So I think the CV systems that you guys use can do surface detection quite well in the sort of local CV environment. But then you've got these open data sets, which have things like building footprints and extrusion polygons and so on in them. Uh, how do you get them to line up? Like, because uh, a lot of that geographical data, unless it's very carefully curated, is going to be quite inaccurate in various ways. Uh, how, how do you solve those problems? Yeah, so for a lot of the data, it depends what we're talking about, but we have uh, confidence scores, and so that's often a, a very useful way to, um, you can toggle that. And, and generally, like, when you're talking about the higher confidence scores, it's it becomes a lot more useful. Um, if we're talking about building footprints, we can uh, look at the, the known environment that we have. So we might already know that there's building footprints there in OpenStreetMap, or we might have um, just the, the semantics of the map around it. So maybe we don't know that there's a building there, but we know that there's a bunch of buildings in that location. So that could be used to infer that this is a population settlement. Um, buildings are usually near roads, which is why a lot of the work we do is um, at least to, to build the base map initially was buildings and roads, because um, once you have that, like you can build out the rest of the map. Um, but it's a great question. There's a lot of inaccuracies with when you're using these technologies, and that's why we've learned the hard way not to just dump it into the map, um, but to have humans reviewing it, and particularly locals who know what they're doing. And so a lot of our data sets, they're open. Groups that are more confident in it, that have trust in it, they can just download it all if they want to. It's available but um, it's not just getting dumped into OpenStreetMap straight away. Uh, so that's, I mentioned briefly, but Overture Maps has a lot of data sets like that. If you want the whole thing, you can download it, but if you want to toggle it with various confidence filters, you can do that too. Um, and I think one more question on the other mic. Uh, so I think one of the states of Australia has just adopted OpenStreetMap kind of as its primary record. Um, they looked at what they had and they looked at what OpenStreetMap had and went, let's just go with OpenStreetMap. Yeah. And then we had Jeremy this morning talking about wanting to build a national kind of authoritative road data set for New Zealand. Um, what's your stance on that sort of potential conflict or do you have like a, an opinion or thoughts on government organisations adopting OSM as their kind of OSM first? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great if governments are adopting OpenStreetMap first. Um, there might be some particular reasons why it might not work for them if there's... So OpenStreetMap has this beautiful anarchy when it comes to tagging. Um, you can, you know, it's got points, lines, and polygons, and you can describe them in any random way that you want. Um, the community tries to come to some collective agreement that this is a highway equals crossing, but anyone could go in and describe it as something differently. So I could imagine a government having to navigate that and, and finding it a bit difficult. Um, that's partially why we created the Overture Maps Foundation, which was to standardize um, for companies building on top of OpenStreetMap what a primary road is in different countries. A uh, primary road in Tanzania might be a, a dirt road that gets flooded half the year, and a primary road in New Zealand is probably a very nicely paved road. So the standards can differ. Um, so, I, yeah, very excited about governments, but I think they might have some troubles around, you know, their need for standardization versus the beautiful anarchy of OpenStreetMap. And I say beautiful because it's, it, I think it's why OSM has been successful, because the barrier to entry is so low, it's, it's adaptable, it's, um, it, it's not top-down in any way. Okay, cool, cool. All right, thank you, Ed.